Hi, this is Dr. Tom Moorcroft. Welcome to Full Cup Life, the podcast that goes behind the science of living well to exposing the truths and tactics to savor all that your journey to greater success has to offer to you every sip of the way. Today, I'll be talking with my colleague and really good friend, Dr. Terry Walls. She's the author of The Walls Protocol, and at, she has a new version out, revised and expanded with tons of new information, and she's going to be sharing all the new stuff that's gone into the revisions in her protocol, latest updates on research, and we dive into a lot about her story, you know, how she had, you know, prodromal symptoms, things coming on that in her early 20s that suggested she may have MS, and then she had the onset in her 40s, and we, we really get to track through her her personal life, her medical story. I've learned, I mean, I know Terry pretty well, but I learned so much more about her today. And I, I mean, I'm really excited to be able to bring this interview to you. If you're a patient um, and you're someone who has MS or another autoimmune condition, she has great tips for you. If you do have MS and you'd like to participate in any of her ongoing trials, she has an invitation for you. So definitely stick around to the end to get that. Practitioners, Dr. Terry Walls has over 90% adherence to her protocols in her clinical practice and in her studies. This, I mean, this is just a mind-blowing number. So if you want to learn tips and techniques and how you can learn from Terry so that you can have that kind of adherence to your protocols in your office, stick around because Dr. Terry Walls is sharing that with us. And, you know, we, we do do a little tangent on something called ApoE4, which is a really important gene to know about in your lipid metabolism and your cholesterol. So Terry uh, tells us a little bit about how we can utilize that to fine tune our diet. And also we talk a lot about how to prevent things like dementia uh, and all autoimmune conditions, uh, even those triggered by chronic infection. So hope you enjoy today's episode, check it out. So Dr. Terry Walls, thanks so much for joining me today. It's, uh, it's awesome to see you again. Oh, I uh, love chatting, <laughs> so this is good. So, yeah, um, and this is a crazy time, and they're, they're, you know, uh, one of the things that I feel is so, you know, I'm trying to look for a silver lining, and one of those things is we have an opportunity to really educate people about, you know, their, the aspects of health that they actually control, and when I think of someone who's been on the forefront of teaching that to the public in very actionable ways, you're the first person who comes to mind through all your work, so uh, I, again, thanks oh, so much for joining you. us. <laughs> Yeah, for everybody. Yeah. You know, it, it's uh, really been a, a remarkable journey um, because you know, I'm a professor of medicine. And so I was you know, very skeptical of functional medicine, integrative medicine, uh, the billions of dollars spent in complementary alternative medicine. Uh, and I was a very much a uh, the newest drugs, latest technology uh, kind of person. Mm. But God has a mysterious way of teaching us. <laughs> You know, uh, and so I got to have a, a little redirection along the way. So, so th this is the part I'm, I'm always interested in hearing where you come from. And like, because I grew up in a similar model <laughs> and it is, it's drugs and surgery, you know. So, so yeah. what, what was that? What happened and, and what got you to this point that you're on this yeah. mission? Well, um, so in 2000, I started getting weakness in my left leg, started stumbling, uh, got evaluated. Uh, uh, ultimately by a neurologist with MRIs of my brain and spinal cord, uh, spinal taps, nerve conduction velocities, lots and lots of blood work. And uh, they found a, one lesion in my brain, a couple lesions in my spinal cord, and said, you know, you forgot to mention that 13 years ago you had a episode of dim vision. Uh, and so that was probably optic neuritis, uh, and this is probably your second relapse. Uh, and um, you have relapse here emitting MS. Uh, and I said, well, what about my episodic uh, face pains, my trigeminal neuralgia? So no, no, they're not related. Okay. okay so right. <laughs> now in, in, in retrospect, those symptoms I uh, had, my face pain began during medical school in 1980. Uh, and they had uh, become steadily worse. Uh, seven years later, I had the dim vision. And then, you know, uh, 13 years later, I had the weakness of my left leg. Uh, and so I, I knew, because I was reading this science, that the natural history of MS was progressive. 
And I certainly believe in the best technology, the best people. So I did some research and went to see the best people in the country, mm -hmm. took the newest drugs, and went steadily downhill anyway. Uh, fortunately, my neurology team uh, mentioned the work of Lauren Prudane. Uh, I read his books, his papers. And uh, this is a big deal because I've been a low fat vegetarian for about oh, 20 boy. years. Oh, boy. And, I, and so, <laughs> you know, after a lot of prayer and meditation, I went back to eating meat. I gave up all grain, all legumes, all dairy. Big, big change in my diet. And I had to sort of ease back into meat because that was a tough transition. But I continued to decline. Uh, in the next year, um, I needed a two recline wheelchair. I took uh, now mitosantrum. I continued to decline. Then I switched to Tizabri, the new biologic everyone was so excited about. I continued to decline. Uh, then I was switched to uh, other you know, disease modifying therapies and continued to relentlessly decline. It was very clear to me that the best drugs from the best people, the most aggressive treatment possible, was not stopping my march towards a bedridden life, uh, a potentially demented life, and uh, potentially intractable pain. Because I, I could clearly see that over the 20 years I've been having my trigeminal neuralgia, that was getting more frequent, more severe, and much more difficult to turn off. Right, so, so you've got multiple sclerosis that's put you in a tilt reclined wheelchair and all those fancy words that you threw out there for everyone are like really expensive, really potentially dangerous and potentially oh, yeah. life-saving life drugs, but they're not working. They're, they're not working. And, and, I, and I want to tell everyone that, yeah, I mean, I read the package insert. I knew that I was accepting a 2% risk of uh, leukemia every time I took uh, latoxantrol. But you know, I was thrilled to take it because... I didn't want to become bedridden, demented, have intractable pain. It, it, yeah, it gave you that, that po the so future it, possibility. It gave you a, a possibility. And I knew that Tizabri, you know, higher risk of infection, higher risk of cancers, uh, higher risk of potentially uh, even more profound disability due to the infection. But I was thrilled to take Tizabri because it gave me hope. And I, it was very clear I had a very aggressive disease. Uh, so... It, 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 and I understand why people take disease-modifying therapies, because you don't want to become as profoundly disabled as I had already become. And I can't I even imagine. See, you know, I, my slope <laughs> downhill was very fast. So, I, you know, and I had two young kids. My, uh, oh, my God. My children were eight and five at the time of diagnosis. So, so, so you started having symptoms, you're saying, like, in the 80s? or 1980. The, yeah, 1980. And, 1980, and 20. when did, and you got, so, you. So I was about 21 when I started having symptoms. Oh my God. At 45, um, I had that, my diagnosis. You know, in that 20 year lag of symptoms that people can't really explain, they can't satisfactorily treat, is very typical of serious uh, systemic uh, autoimmune disease. Right. That is very, very common that you have an autoimmune problem. You see people who give you, you know, do the best they can. You take drugs that are, you know, continually more potent, but you continue to decline. And you keep seeing multiple docs. You know, typically it, it's eight physicians, tens, many tens of thousands of dollars, uh, and uh, 10 to 20 years to make your uh, diagnosis. What makes and it so hard? Well, um, uh, in part because the big symptoms are fatigue. <laughs> right. You and I see that all the time in our primary care clinics. Uh -huh. uh, uh, fatigue, pain, uh, uh, some mental health changes, more anxiety, more depression, uh, uh, maybe some brain fog. You know, those are not very specific symptoms. No, you I mean, see you that just across many disease, many, you... many disease states. Right. You just described like a lot of the people that I see with chronic infections, chronic Lyme disease or mold exposures. But now you're saying that could be the prodrome, the, the beginnings of MS as well. It's the beginning of MS. And it's the same kind of symptoms that I saw in my conventional primary care client. For stress. It's the same, right, right. For, <laughs> for all of their, you know, like complicated issues that, you know, I'm trying to treat symptomatically and eventually there's enough organ damage that I figure out they have inflammatory bowel disease 
or rheumatoid arthritis or Hashimoto's or in my case, MS or anxiety, depression or post-concussive headaches. Right. Uh, and, you know, it was through my own healing journey that I, I began to realize that for many, many, many folks with these non-specific complaints, what they're really dealing with is a prodrome of an autoimmune illness and that you and I know that mm -hmm. often one of the triggers for the autoimmune illness might be an infection because infection is part of that uh, issue. It might be the severe stress and medical school is a little stressful. Just a hair. <laughs> uh, and, and then of course, I, I um, was suddenly inside all of the time. And I believe that stuff that the sunlight would cause skin cancer. So I was using um, uh, sun, you know, sunscreen. So my vitamin D levels had, had you know, fallen very, very low. Uh, I wasn't sleeping, high levels of stress. And because I'm an artist for uh, getting into medical school, I was like so thrilled to be taking gross anatomy. Huh? Like that must've been amazing, this, yeah. This, this is amazing. So I probably have tripled the uh, formaldehyde exposure to my classmates because <laughs> I would do my dissections and then for fun, I'd go back with my notebooks and I'd unwrap the cadavers and I have these beautiful notebooks of the drawings I made of the cadaver. Oh, no way. So, so cool. the, and the year after, my face pain started. So you know, are, are, are they connected? I, I don't know. The, the other um, uh, trigger that I can comment on is, again, because I'm also an athlete before I entered medical school, I, I competed in Taekwondo full contact free sparring, a kick him up sort of girl. Nice. Uh, and of course that, you know, there was no protective gear really. And you got two points for kicking people in the head. <laughs> One point for punching them in the chest, <laughs> you know, and so, you know, I, I was sort of intense and, you know, I competed nationally and, and oh my goodness. Um, I did have, you know, uh, several concussions um, in uh, actually a, a fairly significant concussion where I was really quite dazed and had uh, severe headaches uh, uh, for a while following, and that was in, at the Pan American Trials. It was, it was a thrilling, uh, thrilling competition. Oh my God. Was, and now, you know, as I read the um, literature on concussions and subsequent risk of MS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, you know, again, thinking that two years later, yeah, that's, you know, when I started having my symptoms. So right. there were probably, for me, many potential triggers. The vitamin well, and D, I think that, the stress, uh, the uh, formaldehyde, and of course, my concussions. Yeah, and I, and I think that this is kind of a common story because it's like, I mean, you know, I've had concussions. I was, a, I was actually an anatomy uh, teaching fellow. So I went back and did anatomy voluntarily again and taught it. And, and, and I think that what you see is that people still have, like stuff happens in our normal lives and then we have these other things on top of it, you know? Yeah, you know, uh, I think uh, another way of thinking about this is how much resilience do we have? How much reserve right. do we have? So yes, we, um, and the younger you are, we have more resilience uh, to these or we think, events. And we think we do, because we, we use that resilience up pretty quickly when we're young <laughs> and we're we, more aware we of it now. <laughs> Uh, and so, and then once it happens, you uh, have lost your uh, reserve for your detox, for your hormonal balance, for your uh, recovery uh, after the concussions. Now, uh, damage can accelerate. Right. Uh, and so, medical school is when I lost my resilience. So one of the things that I, I've been talking about a lot lately and really kind of the focus of the podcast is about sort of this notion of the second wave and being able to survive the second wave. And, and I know that that's, we talk about it with COVID-19, but more importantly, I think of it as like when I'm kayaking, if you roll in the surf, there's always another thing coming. There's another wave coming. And like what, what I, when I hear you speaking here, it's like to say the resilience is something that we should be sort of honoring and, 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 and supporting earlier on so that no matter yeah. what is the next thing to come down the road, we have a better chance. So how do we do that? I mean, like, well, and where does yeah. that go in your story? 
so what I learned uh, for it, my own healing journey, and then ultimately I learned for my practice was um, when I had the uh, sort of aha moment, like, well, you know, I'm, I'm starting, you know, I'm reading the basic science. I at first focused on supplements, uh, and actually, I very first focused on drugs. And fortunately, I figured out like, you know, this is crazy. They're not helping. <laughs> I can't access the experimental drugs anyway. So I to read about something I could access. So I went down supplements, figured out that a supplement cocktail slowed my decline, but didn't recover me. Okay. Uh, and fortunately, then I began to get another aha, uh -huh, like, you know, I really ought to just focus on creating health, as, as much health as I can. That'll maybe slow things down. Because at this point, Tom, I have no expectation of recovery because I understand and my neurologist have all told me, my primary care doctor has said, you have secondary progressive MS. You know, recovery doesn't happen. Functions once lost are gone forever. So the goal is to try and slow decline as much as you can. So I'm taking drugs that cost many thousands of dollars every month to, that have the risk of killing me. I'm thrilled to take them because I'm trying to slow my decline. But and fortunately, I begin to read the research about creating health. And uh, now I, I did do some things right from the beginning, uh, and that is exercise. Uh, it, I, I had known from the very first day I was diagnosed that I would have to keep exercising as much as I could mm -hmm. to maintain my strength. My neurologist kept telling me to exercise less. And I would nod in the office and go home and say, screw that shit. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I knew I had to keep exercising in order to hang on to whatever strength uh, that I could. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I, I ran. I did, couldn't run for very long. Uh, then I walked. Uh, then I uh, swam uh, and lifted weights. Uh, and then I couldn't swim anymore. I just did some very simple uh, um, water aerobics. And then I uh, just got down to doing very simple little mat exercises. So over time, but I could get getting smaller, smaller, and smaller, and smaller. But you know, I, I did that every day. Yeah. So and, like, uh, no matter what, you you were always I trying always, the exercise. You were... I, I always exercise every day. And my neurologist would say, "You're you're making your exhaustion worse. You you have to exercise less." So I, I, what I worked out was that it took me a while to finally get this, that I would work out first thing in the morning. And if I worked out so hard that I couldn't go to work, I, I knew that was too much. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, of course, it, it, you know, it, so I kept having to trim things back. So I, I would work out enough so I could still get, you know, go to work uh, and function uh, in my tilt recline wheelchair, in my zero gravity chair. Because um, if I did work out too much, I couldn't even sit up in my zero gravity chair. That'd be flat out for about uh, 36 hours. Wow. So, but it was, but you kept going because you knew there was some benefit. Was that because if you exercised a little, it was better than not exercising? Or was there a research? Because like, I just find myself wondering, like, why are we as a medical system generally telling you, like, do less and less and less, which in my mind, prevents you from um, optimally detoxing, it hastens well, your decline, so. Um, I figured I had to maintain my exercise capacity as long as I could. Yeah. Uh, uh, and whatever limited walking I had was incredibly useful. My hands, incredibly useful. I wanted to keep uh, feeding myself. I wanted to uh, go to the bathroom by myself. So uh, that meant, uh, you know, I wanted to keep, uh, um, exercising so I could continue to uh, be able to do those things. Now, the, by you know, the summer of 07, um, I was realizing that, you know, I, I was still working, you know, the VA and the university were incredibly generous and in redesigned my job multiple times. Um, but it was really hard to walk around the house in the evening. Uh, and so I was like, okay, um, am I going to have to bring a scooter into my home? So I had it, my tilt recline wheelchair uh, at work so I could work. Um, and I'm like, okay. Uh, so that, that's where I'm at. And, and you know, I can't sit up like I am now for more than uh, 10 minutes. I'm having brain fog. My 
uh, face pain is very difficult to manage. I'm on very high dose gabapentin. Um, I'm going to the pain clinic frequently for injections uh, in five days of cytomedrol uh, to get things turned off. And I'm like, I, I know the natural history of uh, trigeminal neuralgia in the study of MS is that it quits being episodic. It converts to continuously on. All the time. And um, I also know that with Dr. Gaborkian, the guy who assisted folks with suicide, the leading diagnosis for that uh, was trigeminal neuralgia that had turned permanently on. Because, yeah. you know, um, all of your sensory input gets transmuted into this uh, intense electrical pains. Uh, and so in your face, I mean, in your face, so constant. You, you, can't, you can't talk, you can't uh, swallow, um, uh, uh, light, sound, uh, a breeze on your face triggers all that. So, you know, what I realized was, <clears throat> okay, if that happens, uh, I simply have, have to uh, decide that there's no feeding tube. Because when you get to the point where you cannot swallow, because it triggers pain and you're drooling, and, it, and that's what would happen to me when it would turn on. I couldn't really talk, I couldn't really swallow, I'd drool. <clears throat> and so it's like, okay, well, so I actually found that comforting, like, okay, uh, you know, um, I, that still gave me a sense of that I still have control. Right. Uh, and fortunately, uh, that summer I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. Uh, and I took their course in neuroprotection. I had a longer list of supplements, which I you know, happily added. Uh, not a lot happened, uh, but then had this, and you'll appreciate this, had this really big aha. Like what if I redesign my diet based on you know, all the basic science I've been reading? Mm -hmm. So I've been following the paleo diet you know, very meticulously. Um, but I wanted to figure out where these nutrients were in the food supply. Uh, so I redesigned my diet in a very, very specific way, continued with my supplements. I also uh, went back to my uh, daily uh, meditation. Uh, and I was working closely with physical therapy on my little tiny little workout that I was doing. We right. added electrical stimulation of muscles uh, to that. because That's sort of an athletic rehab tool. Mm -hmm. And you know, the results were actually quite stunning, Tom. It was just stunning because it was December 25th that I had this very structured paleo diet. And within three months, my pain is gone. My fatigue is remarkably gone. My brain fog is gone. And I'm sitting up again at the table. In three months. Supper. In three months. Three months. Um, and uh, at about the fourth month, I start walking around the hospital with my walking sticks. And uh, people are like, oh my God, Dr. Allison, I was going to say, sticks. like, if I saw you in the hallway, I'd be like, what the hell did you do? <laughs> yeah. And so I'm thinking, like, I'm on Tizabri. And I'm like, no, no, no. Well, this, this is just, you know, nothing new has changed drug wise. I'm just, right. you know, changed my, my diet. It must so be that Walls protocol. <laughs> Um, and then my uh, chair of medicine, uh, when I, over at the university, I went over to see him, and he was so impressed when I walked in. And he too thought, it's like, y'all, this must be uh, those new biologics. I said, no, no, no. They so, didn't work. <laughs> um, he said, Terry, this is so important. Uh, get a case report written up. Um, so we did that. And then he called me back and said, and now you're going to do a safety and feasibility study. And I said, well, you know, I, I don't know how to do those things. That's not the research that I do. I do this diagnostic error. I said, I'll get you the mentors. This is your assignment. This is what you're going to do. So I salute. Wow. Like, <laughs> okay. Uh, so he got me the mentors that actually uh, we uh, did that little study. Uh, and said, you know, the, the research question you have is, can other people implement what you did? Because clearly what you've done is a very complicated regimen. It's so inspiring, though, that, that they would even see that and, and not just poo-poo it. Like, to go, here's a respected colleague who changed all of this. We saw the decline. You reversed it. So that's one thing. But then to dive in and support you and, and essentially mandate you get this out in the world, that's pretty amazing. You know, he, um, I give a huge amount of credit. Paul Rothman was the chair of medicine. So he saw the decline. 
saw the amazing recovery. The other thing that's uh, very helpful is I was on the uh, institutional review board who also saw the decline and the amazing recovery. Mm -hmm. Because of this, you probably could not have gotten this through any other IRB uh, because uh, we really had a hard time getting through that one, as it turned out. Uh, wow. Because the pharmacy and therapeutics committee said there's no safety data other than walls. This is, this is too dangerous. On food and supplements. Well, because food <laughs> supplements, because um, it was a complicated supplement regimen. Right. And um, uh, the e-stem, it said, you know, people don't, won't, won't do it. It's too complicated. Uh, but uh, we did get it all worked out. I had a bunch of, you know, I had to have exclusionary criteria who I would not let in, the safety labs, make sure we, that we monitored everything correctly. And as it turned out, the, the people did have some serious side effects. If they're overweight, they lost weight actually quite rapidly uh, and got back to a healthy body weight. So I ended up having to do these safety reports every three months on uh, the weight loss that people were having and their stabilization. Uh, uh, and I got to do uh, the first 10, uh, and then I had to do a safety report to the IRB, then I could uh, recruit the second 10. Uh, so because the first 10 didn't really take the supplements, we greatly reduced and simplified the supplement regimen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's pretty interesting. The IRB, when the IRB approved my study, they were very precise that we had to um, uh, do what I had done. Like so exactly. The, yep. and, and, the, and the question was, will people do what you did, Terry? And if they do, do you hurt them? So that's the safety part. And then feasib uh, uh, feasibility would actually do it. Right. And then the secondary they question is, uh, what happens, uh, what, the, what the effect size is. And so uh, no, and all I had to show was that there was a trend in the right direction. Uh, for the fatigue scale, and what we what we had was a, a dramatic, dramatic uh, improvement in energy uh, and reduction in fatigue that we saw uh, actually uh, very quickly within 12 weeks. Uh, even and then it, and it continued to improve over the next uh, uh, nine months with a p value of less than 0. 0.0008. Wow. So, so that's you know, really quite significant. It, and again, so, remember uh, the IRB had said, you know, all I had to show was a trend because this is a tiny little pilot study. Right, to see if we should look deeper. If we should look deeper. Uh, so we, we've done uh, uh, three studies. Uh, they've all been published, uh, favorable results. Uh, the fourth study, we're doing the data analysis now. And that one was a much bigger study funded by the MS Society where we're comparing uh, a low-fat diet, the Swank diet, uh, and the Walls diet. And um, depending on when we uh, get our, our data analysis complete, I may be able to uh, present that uh, at the fall uh, international MS meeting in Washington, DC, assuming wow. that by September, we get to have we, meetings where, <laughs> where, we can actually meet? people, where thousands of people will all meet, so. Right. So um, can, are you able to give us like a glimpse into what you're seeing or is that still under wraps at the moment? Yeah, I have no idea. Well, I, I, even if I knew, I, I could tell you guys because then I wouldn't be able to present it. You know, can't right. let the cat out of the bag. And then the other thing that, uh, you know, and this is part of the conflict of interest management plan is the statistician is analyzing the data blinded so they don't know diet we one, diet two, which one is which. Uh, and so when that analysis is complete, uh, it, the, the process usually goes this way. Uh, it'll go back to the final report to the MS Society. Uh, the Data Safety Monitoring Board will make whatever recommendations they have with uh, any tweaks to the data analysis. And uh, ultimately, I will get to see the data. I don't quite know how soon that will be. Uh, right. Soon. Because we're, you know, we, we'd like to be able to submit our uh, a late breaking abstract to the MSB. But you know, and if we can't hit that deadline, then we'll just do it uh, for the spring meeting. Right. Well, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, to to be so rigorous. I mean, so many people are like, "Hey, I'm just gonna like, hey, this changed me." So, and I did it in like three patients, and so let's write a book and let's do all this. And like this, the amount of effort that goes into the sci the scientific rigor 
of what you put into the walls yeah. protocol is, is astounding to me. And if we're going to change uh, the standard of care uh, for how we treat MS, for how we treat autoimmunity, uh, then this is what's required. If I'm going to help usher in an epidemic of health, this is what's required. That's what you, you know, do, it, yeah. It, and fortunately, uh, you know, that, that was so much change that Paul Rothman sat me down and said, yeah, Terry, this, this is what you should do. Uh, and so uh, I happily headed down that path. Well, that's what you, I think that's what we need to do. Not only do we need to help people, but we need to change the way the entire system does. Because like you and I as an individual can help so many people. If you write a book, you can help so many more. But if you can change the way the medical system views MS and they can incorporate this, now you're, you're going to change, you can change well, the whole system. And that's already happening. What, what is so exciting, Tom, um, you know, when I look at, uh, when I started doing my uh, dietary intervention studies, it was, that I, was a, I was the only one doing a prospective food-based dietary intervention study. And that one was a comprehensive, you know, multimodal intervention, diet, stress reduction, exercise, targeted supplements. And uh, it was extremely difficult to get approved. Uh, it, and no one else was doing it on clinicaltrials.gov. So that's 2009 when we, we started all of that. In 2010, when I finally was able to start recruiting. Now in 2020, uh, as a result uh, of my multiple trials, uh, as a result of uh, my TEDx talk, uh, and my books and the public pressure and my influence on the research, now, in fact, there are many dietary intervention studies going on. I think there are... Uh, uh, there have been 15, uh, 13 that are active, uh, and I am involved uh, either as a PI or a member of the study team in five of those studies. Uh, so, are they, you know, full. All of these for MS or? Uh, those are just for MS. And uh, we have dramatically increased the food-based dietary intervention studies for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's, and we've dramatically increased the uh, interest in this uh, multimodal intervention uh, with the main outcome is change in quality of life as the main outcome. And then secondary outcomes are the uh, uh, mechanistic uh, uh, things that happen with uh, the microbiome or the metabolome uh, or other uh, biomarkers. So, so I, I've changed the way research is being done. That's what I was going to say. I mean, I think it's so like, usually when you read research or like primary outcome is like some number or some yes. digit, you know, like some way that we've taken the human's experience of being alive and reduced it to some sort of blood oh. marker, as opposed to putting the individual and their quality of life as the primary endpoint. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think fatigue uh, is perhaps uh, one of the most exquisite measures of uh, efficacy of the intervention. Uh, uh, for MS, uh, for uh, any systemic autoimmune disease. And then uh, overall quality of life uh, responds a little bit later. And then uh, a few months after that, you'll, you may begin to see changes in motor function. Uh, if we, if, uh, well, one of the biomarkers that I'm working with a collaborator on is we like to measure gene expression changes. Uh, it's some of our stored uh, uh, specimens. Uh, because wh what I think probably happens is on a biochemical basis, I, the diet and lifestyle program that, that we've created is changing gene expression. It's also changing your microbiome, uh, which changes you know, the, the various metabolites that come through, uh, which then in your brain uh, lowers your uh, microglia activation. So there's less inflammation in your brain. And my fatigue diminishes, and mm -hmm. my anxiety, uh, and my depression diminishes. And then uh, in a few uh, more months, my quality of life is beginning to improve. And then, you know, depending on the person, the speed of recovery, you know, earlier in disease, this will be a little faster, uh, but my motor strength will begin uh, to improve. Right. But, but it, it sounds like not a... The, What's important, I think, for everyone to understand is that there's certain things we would expect to change sooner, and then as we continue to move forward, it's going to something else will change and something else. But it's it's a journey, 
And the sooner you get, and, and this is, I'm always saying like the early diagnosis, early intervention is critical. One of the things I think we can learn from your work, uh, Terry, is that I don't think, I mean, and correct me, you know, let me know what you think about it, but I think that you can implement the fundamental pieces of the WALS protocol before you're sick. So this oh isn't God, just, yeah. it's not a diet for people who are sick. It's, yes, it's an intervention, but that's the piece. You know, we, we should be doing this ahead of time. I, I'm trying to conv uh, convey to everyone that this is all about healthy aging, living with vitality, that far too many members of our society uh, think that uh, our fatigue, our need for uh, caffeine, energy shots to get through my day's work uh, is, is normal. That right. Uh, I should begin to have a little difficulty with erectile dysfunction in my 30s because, you know, I'm not a young man anymore. That I should lose interest in my honey uh, uh, in my mid-30s because, you know, I, I, I'm just not 18 anymore. Right. That I should not, I should struggle to jog or walk in my early 40s. But that, none of that is true. We should be able to function well into our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And in fact, we should be able to function very well. Yeah. Um, so I want health span. Health span is far more important than lifespan. And that most of us want to be able to uh, have a physical life, a, uh, yeah, an emotionally satisfying life, uh, and want to still enjoy intimacy uh, with our partners. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, my goal is to live to 120 playing with my great grands and grandchildren and whatever kids I can find in the neighborhood that want to play soccer. Right. That would be uh, my goal. Now, if I'm going to do that, um, and I want everyone to have that kind of goal. And if you're going to do that, then you want to be really doing all these diet and lifestyle factors that you and I are teaching the public. Yeah, it, it, it's so inspiring because I mean, I, earlier it's like man, Terry is such a badass, and I mean, I've known that since I read your book. I knew then when we met, but I'm like, but it's like, guys, if you go to the gym with Dr. Terry Walls, watch out, you get a yo, because <laughs> like, I mean, I I I, I can I, I can work out pretty hard and 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 pride myself because like you, Terry, I'm like I mean, 120, 130 sounds really good to me and full bore all the way, but but it's like the thing is like. You know, I, I just remember when we were in Air, we were at a conference in Arizona, and you know, I meet up with you in the gym, and you're like, just rocking out, you know, like you know the um, blood flow restriction bands and doing things, but you're doing very targeted exercises that are yeah. really specific for what you need and taking that into account. Correct. It, you know, and I, you know, we've talked a little bit about my years of suffering with the trigeminal neurology, uh, and of suffering, you know, absolutely. It's brutal. But ironically enough, I now also realize that that's this profound gift. So I have this very exquisite biosensor that tells me the level of inflammation in my brain. Because if I'm doing a great job on my diet, lifestyle, self-care, I, I don't have any pain. But you know, if I'm flying too much, so I have too much stress, if I'm sleep deprived, if uh, I get exposed to gluten, my uh, sensation on my face is a little off, and then the zingers start. I, and so uh, this is, you know, powerful motivation for me to like, you know what, I'll, I'll get up at five o'clock, or, you know, whenever I wake up, I'm happy to say I don't have to set an alarm. I, I get up, I meditate, I do my workouts. Um, and, you know, uh, today I did my East End workout. You can sort of see yep. the device. In the back corner there, yeah. Um, so I hook up uh, to my uh, device, I do my body weight strengthening exercises, uh, then I take my sauna, uh, then I take my uh, cold shower, uh, I do another round of meditation, and then I start my day. And, you know, so you've done like all of this before you even start, start your day, like, yeah, really. That's, a, that's right. your morning yeah. ritual. That's my morning ritual. And then in the evening, I, you know, again, uh, will have uh, another uh, meditation. Uh, I may do a nice bath. I, I might do another round of these stem. Um, uh, uh, and I, I, I've learned to value uh, sleep. Uh, You're you know, here to I, that. You know, uh, uh, so 
and of course, I, I did quickly run into spending two and a half hours a day on self-care, sometimes three and a half hours a day. This was a transition that I slowly evolved into, but I realized that if I do that, my, my, I don't have any problem with face pain. If I let myself get too busy mm -hmm. and start, you know, working too hard on my research, you know, I, my face pain turns on. Well, like, okay. it, it, as another person in medicine who wants to share all this kind of information with people and has a lot of projects going on at any one given time, the thing I'm amazed about is how efficient you are and how much you do get done. Yet, we just talked about two and a half to three and a half hours of self-care per day. And most people, and e even myself at times, I'm like, man, do I really have that kind of time? But I see that like, and, and, and as I've followed sort of you and, and gotten to know you better, like, I almost feel like the more I, at least externally, it looks like the more I hear you talk about spending the time on self-care and really the number has gotten close to three hours, it's like the more prolific you are. Like you're actually yeah. doing more by well, focusing on you. Um, you know, and my chair of uh, medicine, he and I were talking about that. And he's like, I can't believe you spend that amount of time. And I was like, you know, uh, Rich, what I've discovered is what, by spending that amount of time, I've been far more effective uh, at the other times. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, when my pain is turned on, others, I, I can't do anything. You know, that, that is time, it's, it's gone, and it's gone for as long as it takes to get it turned off. I, and so, fortunately for me, the price of not having superb self-care is, is pretty steep. It's very steep. And so many people listening, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, there will be people who are like, right on, I get exactly what Dr. Walls is saying, but... Terry, the other part is I think that so many people are just kind of like, well, but see, that's for Terry and the people who have the MS and stuff. And like, I just, yeah. I'm always trying to find a way to get that message across that well, you have a small barometer if you learn to pay attention to it and respect that before it becomes trigeminal neuralgia and MS. Correct. Correct. You know, and, and the other thing that I uh, work, work with people and I'm teaching my uh, practitioners how to do this uh, is that we, you know, we, we create uh, the big, hairy, audacious goal of, of what they want their health for. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, we, we have a conversation after I've gone through their timeline. What are their likely um, most impactful lifestyle interventions that get their DNA to be better aligned with their behaviors so we can get that evolutionary alignment better? Uh, and then say, okay, let's make some small, smart goals to just begin getting things better aligned. Not big goals, because I, I need you to have something that you could actually be successful at this week. Right. So don't tell me you're gonna work out an hour, uh, three days a week. That's too big a goal. So maybe the goal is you're just gonna call physical therapy and see your physical therapist. <laughs> That's a goal you should be able to achieve. Right. Or maybe the goal is you're gonna go through your cupboard and get rid of all the junk food. So we, we start with uh, uh, helping them identify their big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, and then having a conversation about what are the uh, health behaviors that we're going to work on, and so what's the achievable you're, next step. Yes, you're taking uh, concrete action steps so that you can start to see results. Because like um, it, uh, earlier, you said, I mean, you're talking about like if you, if you do the, pro, your, uh, the WALS protocol, I mean, three months to out of a wheelchair is pretty, like pretty, fa pretty fast. I mean that I don't, that you don't hear that is beyond fast. I mean, it may be, I, I don't know, for, as yeah. a practitioner of in chronic illness, I've seen people suffer for, you know, well over a decade. I'm like, you know, anytime anybody sees anything that they would call even remotely like dramatic in three months is amazing. So this is like next level, like mind blown. Yeah. That's and, a great word. Extraordinary. And what I, what I tell people is, when you're dealing with someone with a uh, chronic progressive illness, uh, uh, whether uh, it's MS or rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, where the, the course is typically steadily downhill. And, and, and mind you, people will gladly pay $100,000 a year or more for drugs to try and hold the course and prevent future damage. So if 
the diet and lifestyle program that I teach you prevents future damage. So all we do is just stop the decline in my research. That would have been like a phenomenal success. That would have been extraordinary. And the fact that half of our folks had um, remarkable clinical improvement in motor function, it, it's just stunning. It's incredible. Uh, and half did, did continue to decline. Uh, uh, so true, we, we couldn't help uh, everyone. But to have helped anyone with progressive MS is astounding. It, it, it's mind boggling. And, and I mean, like when you're talking numbers of 50%, I mean, th some drug trials can't achieve that, right? And I mean, yeah, obviously they the, didn't for you. Uh, Impu right, Impura is a drug <laughs> that's given to help people uh, walking. And I believe it got FDA approval because they were able to help modestly 38%. But remember, with, with progressive MS is a progressive disease, so so there's helping, no helping hope. anyone right helping anyone improve even modestly at 38 percent was still you know people were very very excited about that. I would be too if I had no hope. But it's like what I'm hearing is that I if I can incorporate the principles you teach, I can actually improve my I, you could less help. risk of meds and improve my quality of life at least potentially. You know, it, 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 and so you know, there was a debate, you know, do you take drugs or do the Walls protocol? This doesn't have to be an either or. You know, I think it's a clinical decision, depending on the, the uh, disability that you have right now, the uh, uh, indicators of uh, poor prognosis, number of lesions you have, number of relapses. Drugs might be appropriate from the beginning, or you can wait three months, do a diet and lifestyle, and then make a decision. But everyone should do diet and lifestyle. Our yeah. leading neuroscientists are now saying drugs alone will not be enough. Drugs alone, uh, you'll still have uh, more rapid brain volume loss, higher rates of cognitive decline. So everyone should improve diet quality, add stress reduction, add exercise, don't smoke. It's like they, read, they finally have read the book. Right. The well, it's on how the body works. Yeah. No, no, no. It's this, this book, this book. Right? <laughs> because, you know, well, it's funny. I was going to say, um, I don't, I, I mean, there's so many cool things to talk about. And I mean, I was just uh, thinking on like, I want to make sure we segue and talk about the, 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 the all the updates. Cause there's a couple of things I have questions about, but one thing that just struck me was, you know, even if you feel like medications are, are something that you want to pursue, or that maybe your condition is so severe, maybe you need to pursue. Oh, yeah. I feel that anybody who sits down and goes, if you're, the more resilient you are going in, the better your result is. And to me, it's almost like if I need meds, I want to do the walls protocol for three months and then add the meds on top. If, if I need to, I may find out I don't, but at least I give the drug a better chance to help my body because I've given my body yeah. a chance to have the nutrients it needs. Now, it's interesting. So uh, the neurology folks in the MS clinic here at the university, if they, of course, would prefer people to go on drugs because that's the standard of care. But if somebody comes in and says, look, I really want to do diet and lifestyle, I want to wait and see if I could do this without drugs. They're like, okay, that's fine, but you have to do the walls at least 110%. There's no cheating. Nice. Uh, and then they just see them every three months. And as long as they're doing well, no relapses, no new lesions on the MRI, uh, then they just follow them frequently. Uh, and they see that, you know, some folks do very, very well. Right. It's awesome that they're so open to it. So um, the cat's out of the bag. Def we've got the new book. <laughs> we've got revised yeah, and updated. Yep. I'm looking at it right on my screen here. Um, too. Okay. And one of the things that I, I'm always trying to empower people to understand that they have a lot more um, control over their health outcomes and, and the way their life goes. And maybe we've been taught by the conventional up system and our conventional upbringing. And yeah. a lot of people are afraid, they don't like the fatigue. A lot of people are afraid of Alzheimer's and dementia. And so I know that you really pulled out a piece on the APOE4 um, yeah. risk mitigation. So 
So where's that all coming in? Because I know it's important in MS, yeah. but it's also dementia and Alzheimer's, a big piece. It is, it's really big. You know, it's actually, it's very cool. The APOE4 community reached out to me uh, because they discovered my work uh, and have implemented it and have found it to be very, very helpful uh, with uh, improving their energy, their quality of life, their cognition. I've met uh, with them uh, and met 90-year-olds who are uh, APOE4 homozygous still playing chess, still traveling the world to come to events that I'm speaking at. Uh, and uh, so uh, I've spent a lot more time reading and thinking about uh, Alzheimer's and cognitive decline as a result of my collaborations uh, with the AP4 community. So for anyone who doesn't know, can you fill us in a little bit on what yeah. APOE4 is? So this is a genetic marker that if you have um, uh, the APOE2 gene, you're at lower risk for Alzheimer's. The APOE3 gene, two copies, you're at average risk. If you have one copy of APOE4, then you're about four times the risk. If you have two copies, then you're about 20 times the risk. So dramatically higher uh, at risk of uh, Alzheimer's cognitive decline. Uh, and what we, we now have, uh, and the research continues to grow, that this is a uh, Alzheimer's, as a disease category, and then even APOE4 is very amenable to diet and lifestyle risk mitigation. So this is all about that quality, stress reduction, exercise, reducing toxin exposure, uh, you know, the kinds of concepts uh, that I teach, you know, getting rid of the uh, food items to which you, are, you may have unrecognized sensitivity, such as gluten, dairy, eggs, uh, uh, eating a more nutrient-dense diet, uh, if you're APOE4, I don't want you to, ha uh, to have saturated fat, but I put you more on the olive oil uh, program. Uh, and then I want you to follow your lipids very closely and follow your blood sugar very closely to be sure those two areas are very well controlled. So you're making modifications of the WALS protocol based upon some of these, the emerging this research in the genetics. In, yes, yes. And it's, indiv it's more individualized at that point. I'm much more individualized, you know, and I talk a lot about uh, the benefits of uh, fasting or ketosis, but what, what a lot of people, and I didn't realize this either, you know, the high fat diet uh, that, that, we, that uh, is used for the ketogenic diet was, it's only been around about 100 years. For the vast majority of time, our ancestral mothers and fathers, if we went back, you know, 250,000 years ago when we were first were homo sapiens, we were long distance hunters. Mm -hmm. The boys in the clan would, would run down the prey, uh, you know, uh, two to eight hours, 24 hours of tracking and harassing the prey. Then they kill them, carry them, bring them back. Then the mothers of the clan would prepare the, the food. Uh, they also would have been doing some uh, intense physical activity with their own version of uh, hunting, gathering, and watching the kids. Mm -hmm. So we're in ketosis by virtue of physical activity. This is what people forget. We were at, we were in, at occasionally we'd be in ketosis because we were starving. There was no <laughs> right. food, and we were in ketosis because we're burning our own fat. We were never in ketosis because we were eating that much fat day after day after day. If we had a particularly good hunt and you happen to get a fat animal in the fall, then you might have a, a fattier meal, but it wouldn't be just pure fat. It wouldn't be fat, the 9% right. fat. That's a very new phenomenon. And so for clinical, there, there are certainly clinical indications where that high fat diet uh, uh, does make a lot of sense. But historically, from an evolutionary standpoint, we're in ketosis because of exercise or there was no food. Mm -hmm. And the ketogenic diets that people are talking about are very, are, are very new, artificial. And so I think they can be extremely helpful for specific clinical indications. Uh, I, uh, so yes, I'm very fond of uh, ketogenic eating, but I, 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 I'm less inclined to recommend a medium change or glyceride high fat diet for everyone. I would right. do it for certain clinical indications. I want to follow up the lipids to know that they're safe. Um, I would probably pair the olive oil ketogenic 
eating pattern with time restricted feeding or a periodic fast. Mm -hmm. uh, or if the person uh, is an endurance athlete with intermittent endurance athletics. Yeah, it's interesting. I noticed that because I, I've been known to do things like long distance running and, 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 and obscenely long distance cycling at high, pay, at high rates of speed. And, you know, one of the things I noticed is that if I taught, you know, I would do these um, long rides and if I went into them sort of more in a, a higher, higher, not high, but higher fat, lower carb state, and then just put in my, some of the specific carbohydrates that would help me just get through the whole thing. My performance is dramatically different, so I would tweak. Yeah, but it was crazy. I remember one time I was I I, I was going out with this group of guys, um, many of whom were semi-professional cyclists and just happened to be friends of friends of mine. So I got you know to go along, and one night I ate dinner a little earlier than usual. So then I'm like, oh, I'll carb load late at night, you know, and like like I used to do in high school running, you know. And the next day my performance is terrible. And two weeks later, I go out and I just say, you know what, I'm going to have my regular dinner, my regular breakfast. I'm just, I'm going to stick with the principles I know that work. And I, I was able to ride with them just fine. So two weeks difference yeah. and, and just like, you know, this change in my diet. And it, and it almost doesn't matter what it was. It was like I knew for my body it probably wasn't right, but I just kind of haphazard tried it and it <laughs> miserably failed. So, you know, I, I think that... Yeah. So, so for, for, for the people who are here, so if we have an E3, E3, which is thankful, I mean, I guess maybe thankfully what I have, at least I don't have a higher risk. Um, well, you still don't want to have Alzheimer's, so. I still no, 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 I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I, want, I want you to still take care of yourself there, Tom. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm definitely about that, Terry. I, I guess what I mean is there were, I, I, may, I may be able to have a little bit more saturated fat than sort of the, the APOE4 yeah. people. But at the same time, I don't want to go over the top. Correct, correct. You know, I, I think um, following lipids makes uh, a lot of sense to know how you're tolerating your current diet uh, and uh, making adjustments accordingly. If what you have what are you looking for? What are you well, looking for, though? Because there's so much like, right. oh, 130, blah, 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 you know, so, 100 so LDL. Is, you, need, you need to have enough cholesterol to make your testosterone and your vitamin D and your cortisol because yep. we want everyone to be happy in your home. Um, so <laughs> in, in general, I prefer a cholesterol between 200 and 250. Total. I, I think that's uh, uh, total cholesterol. Uh, and then you can decide if you want to get uh, fancy into particle uh, size and, uh, and, and all of that. If your cholesterol is over uh, uh, 250 to 300, I, I'm, I'm easy. If it's over 300, uh, I mean, I'm really going to work on that. Uh, and uh, the fats that you're consuming are not good for you. Uh, and so we'd really want to shift uh, your eating pattern. Right. If you have diabetes or heart disease or you've had a stroke, uh, then, uh, uh, then I would tolerate having a lower cholesterol. Um, it, and if uh, the person emotionally is you know, very fat phobic uh, and they want to have a lower cholesterol, uh, I'll have some negotiation with them over what is the cholesterol target that they are comfortable with. Right. But, but the key here is that there, the cholesterol is not like necessarily bad and it actually has some functions for an, you know, immune function and, and anti-inflammatory. And like you said, hormones and, and, so anti, critical. Anti-infection. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's important to uh, protect us against infection. It's important for uh, uh, producing myelin. So it, it, uh, and we look at, I just uh, updated my review of the nutrients that it, again, in animal models or human studies, have been associated with remyelination, and cholesterol is one of them. And hmm. uh, cholesterol in your diet does not increase the risk of relapse. So, has anyone looked at, it, you know, because like to me, I'm mean, immediately the first thing my doctor brain goes to is, I know that everybody with MS, people are are going to be extra worried about cardiovascular disease, so they're gonna in a conventional model. I would be trained to bring their cholesterol low even fat. lower, right. low right. fat, so, making well, it a low LDL, below 70 and all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Has anyone looked at like the well, cholesterol level and MS outcomes? So um, <laughs> those are some of the outcomes that we will be reporting. So I can't at wait. some point, I'll be able to talk about that more specifically <laughs> than I can now, but not all quite right. yet. 
So somebody's looking at it though. That's good. We are looking at it. Awesome. Well, I mean, you know, what, anything else that's really jumping out? Cause I, I'm recommending well, everybody go and check your out, your yeah, revised so let's, protocol let's out. Let's get this. Uh, and then uh, if people are practitioners, um, yeah, I think uh, they should think about coming uh, and working with us, getting trained. Uh, we have a practitioner program to teach people these concepts uh, because what I, what I've done that I think is unique is we, have evolutionary biology, uh, ancestral health, functional medicine, behavioral uh, psychology, the science of behavior change, uh, and this 15 step walls behavior change model that we use in our clinical trials, in my clinical practice, uh, because we have extraordinary levels of adherence. In my clinical trials, we've had 90% adherence to these very complicated regimens. 90%? 90% at dietary adherence. Isn't that astounding? If you're, yeah, I mean, if you're a practitioner, you got to hop on learning how to do this because like, seriously, if I could have 90% of people pay attention to what I'm asking them to do, talk about changing the world, Terry. <laughs> and, and the reason your people don't get better um, or my people don't get better in clinic has to do not with that you and I ordered the wrong test or told them to do the wrong supplement. It's whether or not we can get the person willing to make these big diet and lifestyle changes and to be successful at it. Um, and that's um, one of the big things that we teach. Uh, and the other, the other thing that I teach, you know, I, um, I love uh, A4M, I love IFM, they, they teach great stuff, but they have such an intensive uh, uh, teaching for advanced testing, uh, 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 complicated botanical uh, regimens. The people I took care of in the VA live on food stamps, don't mm -hmm. have money. I couldn't do fancy testing. My, uh, I could do very basic supplements, but what I could do was, you know, uh, evolutionary biology, health behaviors, uh, motivational, um, uh, creating the desire for change. And so I learned how to do all those things and teach people how we can do these functional medicine concepts when if you're in a practice environment where your toolbox doesn't let you do these comprehensive testing doesn't, right. and your patients don't have the money for comprehensive testing or they may not have the money for these uh, complex botanicals but we still have remarkable transformations right and it's it's so inspiring to me terry because you know, that is one of the things like you go to a lot of these conferences, you learn all this fancy information and then you go back in on Monday and you're like, uh, I either just got sort of like a lot of cool science and I don't know what to do with it. Or it's so over the top that where do I start at with the person who actually is walking into my office today, who's a real person. And we all know that it doesn't matter how, I mean, you said it so well, it doesn't matter how complicated the protocol is and how good it is if we can't get them to do the protocol, whether it's one pill or six pills and 10 lifestyle changes, if we can't get them to buy into their own health, they're not gonna be getting better, Correct. so. Correct. Awesome. Dr. Terry Walls, well, it's amazing to talk to you again. Yeah, I'm, I yeah. feel so grateful to uh, be able to call you a friend and a colleague, and I mean, my, I'm so blessed to know you, and I'm always inspired, as are my family, and. Uh, uh, well. Uh, two more things I, I, sh I should pitch. I realize um, people should know that we're recruiting uh, for our next clinical trial. People newly diagnosed with MS, uh, newly diagnosed with clinical isolated syndrome, reach out to our study team at ms.study at healthcare.uio.edu. I'll get you those links, Tom. Yep, and I'll make sure I provide them so everybody can just click right on them and go over to there. Uh, and if you want a one-page handout uh, for our uh, diet that's terrywalls.com forward slash diet uh, that will give you a one page summary to get started and practitioners come check out uh, my website certification program would love to uh, get you trained yeah i'm working on that part too you know because it's it, that it's so important to uh, dive in and and be able to, to to learn from someone you know the thing is like you're not just somebody who discovered some fancy science. It's like you're, you're a patient who went through this and you know what it feels like and you were able to create something from the ground up, from the inside out. And to me, that's, that's so, that's healing happens from the inside out. And you, I mean, you created this whole thing for you and now you're sharing it with the world. And I mean, I just really appreciate you making the time to share it with us 
and we I want to make sure that we can we'll we'll get all that information out to everybody. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, it's so cool. How often does somebody invite you to be part of what they're doing? And like, so here, practitioners, come join me. Patients, I've got a spot for you because I want to help change your life, and I want you to be able to help change other people with MS's yeah. lives as well by being part of the mission. So, Absolutely. Thanks so much, Dr. Terry Walls, and I'm sure we'll do this again real soon. Love you, Tom. Love you too, Terry. Talk soon. Thanks for listening. Don't miss out on a single thing. Subscribe to our podcast and then join me at tommorcroft.com.